once again we thank you for your company this evening as we discuss this very interesting and vital topic. The subject of the Antichrist seems to have become of great interest in recent times. Many books have been written in which a variety of theories concerning who or what is Antichrist have been presented. Several weeks back we had a lecture here on the Sunday evening dealing, dealing with what is commonly called the rapture and in this lecture the detail of the false teaching concerning the Antichrist was extensively covered. So we don't intend to repeat those details this evening. If we have a clear understanding of what is taught in Holy Scripture as to what Antichrist and the Antichrist really is, we will not be led astray by false teachers. Before we look at what the Holy Scripture has to say about Antichrist, we need to ask the question, why is this important? And I'd like you to come with me to John chapter 14. <coughs> In one of the prayers of the Lord Jesus Christ, recorded by the Apostle John, we read these words. John chapter 17, verses 1, 2 and 3. John 17 verse 1 These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said Father the hour is come glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him and this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. We have those words on the screen before you now, with some sections underlined. And when we look at this, we find that two very important points come out of these three verses, particularly out of verses two and three. We learn that life eternal is a gift to be given to some. You notice that in Christ's words he said he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Therefore eternal life is not an intrinsic characteristic of all flesh or the human race. There is no such thing as an immortal soul. Immortality is a gift limited to some. And the second point to arise out of these verses is that the knowing of God and Christ here is much more than being appraised that they exist. It is more than knowing the basics of what the Bible reveals concerning God and his Son. In the English Bible we have before us, it is a translation from the Greek language in which the New Testament was originally written, of which there are literally thousands of portions or fragments available to study. So to get the exact meaning of Christ's words, we must look to see what word was used in the recording of this prayer. A common word for knowledge used in the Greek version of the Bible is gnosis and simply means to be acquainted with, a passing knowledge. But the word used here in Christ's prayer is epignosis, and it indicates an exact or complete knowledge. It is not a passing acquaintance, but a deep and complete understanding, in this case, of the eternal Father and his Son, who they are, what is their relationship in substance and rank? This is epignosis, or complete, exact knowledge. So how is this relevant to our address this evening? If we have exact knowledge of God and his Son, we will not be misled in what or who is Antichrist. 
If we know God and his purpose through Christ, we will be able to discern Antichrist and we will not fall into the error of mistaking Christ for Antichrist. Now your, your church may have told you, depending upon your church, you may not even have heard mention of Antichrist, but some denominations seem to be more concerned with it than others, especially the Roman Catholic and the more Pentecostal variety. The general idea goes like this. Antichrist is a person who claims to be Christ returned from heaven. They say it will be a false claim. Then this person sets up his government, for want of a better term, in Jerusalem. He claims to be the Jewish Messiah. He demands all governments of the world to submit to his authority. And the powers of the world, along with the Christian so-called religions, will go to war against this Antichrist and attempt to destroy him. These ideas are based mainly on portions of the book of Revelation and some sections of Daniel. But interestingly, none of these references actually use the word antichrist. The use of antichrist in these references is an interpretation based on the lack of epignosis, exact knowledge of the divine plan and purpose. And you might be excused if you thought that this was a relatively modern concept. But as we're going to show you, the false teaching of Antichrist is centuries old. And we're going to show you where it originated. So we're going to focus this evening, as our title indicates, on what your church has not told you. So rather than looking at the biblical references which are twisted to support the false ideas, we will now look at the Bible verses which actually use the word antichrist. And I'd like you to turn with me to the first letter of John. That's right towards the end of the New Testament. First letter of John and chapter 2. There are actually only five occurrences of the word antichrist. Antichristos in the New Testament and none in the Old. And we be, begin to read of some of them in 1st of John chapter 2 verses 18 and 19 where John records <clears throat> little children it is the last time and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time they went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. We put those words on the screen for you with, with some points that we now draw out of them. First of all, John says that the disciples knew that Antichrist would come. They would know this from the prophets. But he says that even now, that is when John was writing, there were many Antichrists in the world. And he says the very existence of Antichrists in the world, as prophesied, he says you will know it is the last time. And actually in the Greek, the word that is used here by John is literally the last hour. The Greek word is aura, from which we get the English word hour. And he says concerning these antichrist that they went out from us, that they may be manifest that they were not of us. Of us. That is, it was manifest that they were not true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when John says here it is the last hour, John is referring here to the closing years of the Jewish commonwealth under Roman supervision. The years leading up to AD 70 and the Roman overthrow of this Jewish commonwealth. So in effect he is telling his contemporaries that they know it is this last hour because of the development of this antichrist doctrine. It is a sign to them 
of the end of the age. Now we look at the same chapter in verses 22 and 23 where the word is used again. John, 1st of John chapter 2 verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. <coughs> so from this we get two points. He that denies Jesus is Christ, or the Messiah, John says is a liar and an antichrist. And if he denies this, he in effect denies also the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here is the, the next use of the term antichrist. Now we move on in the same book to chapter 4 of John, uh, first of John, chapter 4 verses 2 and 3, where again we find John uses this word Antichrist. First of John chapter 4 verse 2. He says, Thereby we know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. So once again John repeats these points, that they knew that Antichrist should come, and he says it has come, it is even now in the world. <coughs> but the points he makes are this. The Spirit of God, he says, that is true doctrine, confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh is Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist, that is the anti-Christian doctrine, is even now already in the world, says John. <coughs> now we turn to the last occurrence of the word Antichrist, and it's in the second letter of John, just a page or two further on. There is only one chapter, so we go to verse 7. Second epistle of John, verse 7, where John records, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Many deceivers are entered into the world, says John, who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now we've seen a number of points come out of these verses and I've actually collected them together here. We've had to squeeze them onto the screen, but I hope you can follow them. Here is a summary of the points that we have made out of these five occurrences in the first and second letter of John. <coughs> He says to the disciples of Christ, you have already heard that Antichrist shall come. He says that even now there are many Antichrists, and he's speaking in approximately AD 60. He says the spirit of Antichrist is even now already in the world. There are many deceivers are entered into the world. He says by this we know it is the last time or the last hour. He says they went out from us, that it might be manifest that they were not of us. And then he starts to get a bit more specific. He says, He that denieth Christ is a liar and an antichrist. Those who confess not that Jesus is come in the flesh. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is antichrist. And this is a deceiver and an antichrist. And those who deny the Son in this way also deny the Father. So just summarising this even further, we learn that Antichrist was not something in the far off future. John says it is already in the world. And he says many Antichrists were existent, in existence in John's day. 
And anyone who denied that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, says John, is Antichrist. And an Antichrist not only denied the Son, but in so doing also denied the Father. But what does this expression Antichrist mean? We've taken a definition from the Oxford Dictionary here for you to look at. <coughs> It says that Antichrist, and it's put a K in there to help us pronounce the CH, he says it's a noun, it represents the enemy of Christ. And the A with a squiggle is, represents the word Antichrist, and the Antichrist is the other term. And he says both of these terms, according to the, the, uh, the dictionary's understanding, is that they represent the great personal opponent of Christ expected by the early church to appear before the end of the world. And we won't worry about going into defining the, the end of the world that it really applies to. This will become apparent as we go on. But now we need to consider what is it that John means by his expression, came in the flesh. I'd like you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we read these words, of verse, 22, uh, yeah, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So these, on the screen now, those words, um, and I've taken them from a slightly different translation, but it says the same thing. So what points do we get out of this verse? First and foremost, most we're told that Jesus of Nazareth was a man. Second, he was approved of God, and that God did miracles and wonders and signs through him that this man was crucified and slain and God raised up because it was not possible that he should be held by death. So the points we should take from this, we wish to take from this, is that firstly, Jesus of Nazareth was a man. The apostle does not write that Jesus was God. But this verse in Acts 2 tells us that God did work through him. So we need to take this a step further. Jesus of Nazareth was a man. I'd like you to turn with me to Romans chapter 7 for our next considerations. What is it about flesh that to deny it in Christ makes one an antichrist? <clears throat> We're going to read some words of the Apostle Paul which are very relevant to solving this question. Romans chapter 7 and verses 14 to 20. The Apostle Paul writes, <clears throat> For we know that the, that the law, that is the law of God, is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent to the law that it is good. But now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So here is the Apostle's words. 
And I've just taken uh, some verses here. It's verse 18. We want to note particularly the words where he says, For that I know in me, then in brackets, that is in my flesh. And then in verse 20 he says, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now the interesting thing is <coughs> that when Paul writes in verse 18, for I know that in me that is in my flesh, in the expression in my flesh, he uses exactly the same Greek word as, the, as John used in his, les, in his uh, letter, saying that if we deny Christ came in the flesh. It's the Greek word sarxi. And the importance of this we will see in a moment. So we ask the question then, what is it that is inherent in this sarxi or flesh that the apostle says stops him from performing that which is good? In verse 14 he says, I am sold under sin. An interesting expression it relates to being a bond slave. And so the effect of this is not a bias or a leaning, it is being sold as a bond slave to perform the will of his master. In verse 20, he refers to this problem as sin that dwelleth in me. So here is something that is intrinsic, something that is indwelling. It is part of the physical <coughs> constitution of all men. Paul is telling us that he, along with all mankind, is enslaved to something he calls sin dwelling in me, an indwelling principle or law. <coughs> in verse 21 and 23, Paul goes on and he defines the problem further. Romans 7 verse 21. He says, I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God in the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So when we analyse these words, we will find the Apostle Paul here is speaking of two laws first one he mentions is the law of God, which if we read him carefully, we find that he says it can enter in and take root in the mind or form a, a, a form of thinking. He says there is a second law which he calls the law of sin and he says this is in his members or his limbs, it's in his very physical constitution. It's in every human being, including the Son of God who was made of a woman, made under the law, as we read in Galatians 4.4. 4. And Paul says that this law in his members has taken him captive like a prisoner. This word flesh, as we've read here in Paul's writings, or as it is in the Greek text, sarxi, in verse 8, is exactly the same word used by the Apostle John in his first and second letters. Just remind you of those. First of John chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 where he says, Hereby ye know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus has come in the flesh, sarxi, is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, sarxi, is not of God. And the same in second letter and verse 7. Those who confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, Sarxi, the same one that Paul says has got a major problem, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. <coughs> and so the Apostle Paul <coughs> excuse me, recognising that he was sold under sin, enslaved by a law in his members that was constantly attempting to cause him to transgress, to cross over a line. At the end of Romans 7, the Apostle Paul is drawn to exclaim, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me 
from the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so here the Apostle acknowledges that the only way of escape this death-dealing law was through the work of God in Jesus Christ. Now we come on to Galatians uh, chapter 3 and verse 21, which we put on the screen to save you turning it up. Here in Galatians 3.21, again the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? By no means. For if a law were given which was able to make alive, certainly righteousness would come from that law. Um, that's the Diaglot translation, which perhaps makes things a little bit more obvious. The Apostle Paul is saying, if it were possible for God to set a law before mankind by which they could achieve righteousness, he would have done it. But then he goes on in Galatians 4 and verse 5 and, and explains to us what the divine solution to the problem that he'd raised at the end of chapter 7 is. He says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. So what was the problem? Why was it impossible to write a law by which righteousness could be obtained? You probably still have your Bibles open at Romans chapter 7. Just look across at Romans chapter 8 and verse 3 and we find the explanation. Romans 8 and verse 3. Remember Paul has said that if it were possible to write a law for righteousness, it would have been done. And now Paul says here in Romans 8 and verse 3, for what law, as it should be, what law could not do, why? In that it, is, it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in saksi, the flesh. Same word again. So the problem is that flesh is weak. It could not keep a divine law. It is impossible for it to keep a divine law by which it could attain to righteousness. And to deal with this, God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for the express purpose of condemning sin in the flesh. It is because of this central issue that Jesus came in the flesh, Sarxi, in order to condemn sin in the flesh. That if one then denies that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, this Sarxi, it marks one out as an antichrist. Now, just very briefly, just to let you see that John was not alone in warning true believers in the first century of false doctrine that would exclude from the kingdom of God. There are many such warnings in the letters in the New Testament, and we'll just pop through a few of them. In Acts 20, the Apostle Paul writing, uh, recording what he said to the elders of the community of believers in Ephesus. He said to them, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Writing in Galatians 1 to the Galatian believers, the Apostle Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And they would do this by denying that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he repeats himself to reinforce the message. The Apostle Peter, in his second letter on these two um, sections here, speaks very, very strong language about false teachers that were arising in that first century. 
he's referring back to Israel in times past. He says, but there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who will privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And then he uses this poetic language to describe these types of false teachers. He says they are wells without water. That's a useless well. Clouds carried about with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. And then in chapter 3 in verse 17 of this uh, epistle of Peter, 2 Peter, he says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know things, these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your steadfastness. And finally, in the letter of Jude, again only one chapter, <coughs> so we have verses 11 to 13. And he writes, Woe to them, these false teachers, for they have gone in the way of Cain. You might recall, he slew his brother and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. He would only preach if you paid him. And they perished in the gainsaying of Korah. He says, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved blackness of darkness forever. And in another place, these false teachers are likened to dogs returning to their own vomit, and sows returning that have been washed, returning to wallow in the mire. Very strong figurative language. Let us now consider briefly the development of the Antichrist. We haven't seen anything with the definite article in front of it. John in his epistle just refers to Antichrist and there were numerous of them. So there were many individuals that he defined as being against Christ. So, so far we've seen that the apostles warned frequently about departure from the true faith. John warned about turning aside from the truth, that it was already at work. That they were in his days, as he wrote, even now already in the world. But our title this evening was to draw attention to the Antichrist, not so much as to many Antichrists. So we need to see if the apostles warned of a preeminent person or a system of Antichrist. If there was such a thing, or if there is such a thing, we would expect from John's writings that the most prominent feature of its teaching would be that Jesus Christ did not come in flesh, sarxi, flesh common to all mankind, that physical nature which contains the law of sin in its members. Now one such significant warning is found in the letter of Paul to the believers at Thessalonica. It's a little bit squashed up because I wanted to get it all on the screen at once, but we'll go through it. Writing to the believers in Thessalonica, the apostle is having to correct a misunderstanding. They thought that the return of Christ from heaven to set up the kingdom was going to be very soon. And he has to inform them that certain things have to take place before that can occur. So he says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that is the return of Christ from heaven, he says, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that, he, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let 
until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. <coughs> now, we've highlighted certain things here. He said, first of all, don't be deceived. That day can't come except there is a falling away first. Then he says, <coughs> there's going to appear a man of sin. And he's going to sit pretending that he's God in his temple, showing himself that he is God. But he says, for the moment, something is holding this back. But he says, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. We've seen that from John's epistles and the writings of the other apostles. But he says, he who now let us will let, we'll explain that in a moment, until he be taken out of the way. Then that wicked will be revealed. <coughs> now here's a summary of the points coming out of those verses. That the day of Christ would not come before there had been what the apostle had, had we have in English, a falling away. You see we've got up there the Greek word apostasia. That's the word from which we get the English word apostasy. And it means a turning out of the way. And here in the English Bible it has been rendered a falling away. It means to swerve out of the way, not to stick to the straight and narrow path. And we see that the Apostle Paul is telling the Thessalonians here that this falling away will reveal what he terms that man of sin. He says this man of sin will present himself in his temple as if he were God in person. He warns them that a, that a way of thinking is already at work which will produce this man of sin. But he says, he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, as we saw. That's Old English for prevent. So we should read... So he's told us that the preventer is going to be removed and then this mystery of iniquity would reveal itself as a wicked thing. Now the preventer in the days of the apostles in the Roman Empire was the fact that the Roman Empire was under the belief of the pagan Roman system in which they worship their great collection of gods. Um, many of which have given their names to our planets, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, and so on. And while that was the state religion, this apostate system had to work undercover. But in AD 313, Constantine became the, the emperor of the Roman Empire, and he had espoused the teaching of these anti-Christians, anti and he made them the state religion. So when Constantine brought pagan religion in Rome to an end, then this antichrist system was allowed to flourish, that, that which prevented had been removed. And that mystery revealed itself as a wicked thing. And as we saw right at the end of those verses in Thess Second Thessalonians, that this wicked system, this wicked mystery system, will continue to exist until the return of Christ from heaven who will consume and destroy this mystery of iniquity from the earth as he says that shall destroy it with the brightness of his coming. So here we have a development. Firstly there was to be a falling away or an apostasy from the truth in verse 3. The further development of this apostasy was held back by the con pagan constitution of the Roman Empire that which withholdeth, in verse 6. The mystery of iniquity was already at work as an underground organisation, in verse 7. And that that which withholdeth, in verse 7, was taken away in the time of the first so-called Christian emperor, Constantine. And paganism was replaced with what they called Roman Christianity. And eventually, the man of sin was, would be revealed, as we read in verse 3. And that this man of sin would exalt himself, claiming that he was God on earth. 
And finally, this apostate system is defined as <coughs> wicked, and it would survive until the coming of Christ, who will utterly destroy it from the face of the earth. Now we just remind you of what the opening words were there in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now the day that uh, Paul is referring to here, that that day, uh, he explains to us in verse 1, if you turn up this uh, 2 Thessalonians verse 1, he defines it in, in verse 1 as the day of Christ. That is the day of his return from heaven, not AD 70, but a much more distant day. A day which is much nearer to in our time. That is the day of Christ's return. It is what the scripture calls the end of the times of the Gentiles. This end is a prelude to the establishment of God's kingdom on earth until the initial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. 